Hello, everybody, and welcome to Blindsided by Emotions, a discussion of one of the biggest um, unrecognized stumbling blocks that many of us with ADHD do struggle with. My name is Steve Sampson. I'm the video content producer for Renify, and uh, we're very pleased to be hosting today's event. Um, I'd like to tell you a little bit about Renify and what we do here before handing it over to, uh, to Renee and to Duane for the main event. Uh, Renify, which is R-E-N-A, dash fi.com uh, stands for Renaissance Financial. And like the historical Renaissance, when people began to see the world in a whole new way, we want to help people see their own personal financial world in a whole new way. So what we do is we help people to understand and make changes in their own finances. We're a, a personal financial literacy education company. Also, our founder and CEO, Rick Webster, has ADHD. I have ADHD. Our IT manager has ADHD. She's here on the call, but she's lurking. She's um, watching the, um, the live chat and uh, feeding questions to us as, as you type them. So we all have ADHD and we get it. Uh, there are some pretty unique challenges that ADHD presents when it comes to personal financial stability and success. And so we, we provide um, courses and events and uh, video library and other resources that are specifically ADHD friendly, although they would still apply to just about anybody who wanted to make changes uh, and have a, a, a better, more stable uh, personal financial life. So with that, thank you again, everybody, for your attendance. Thank you, Dwayne and Renee, for uh, hosting and, and facilitating this event. And with that, Dwayne, I'll hand it over to you. Perfect. Welcome, everyone. Uh, glad to see so many people here. This is, uh, I, I thought this was an extremely important topic uh, be, simply because I'm, I'm also an adult with ADHD, as is Renee, and, and we're from ADA, the Attention Deficit Disorder Association, an organization, uh, you know, run by and for adults with ADHD. Uh, I know that emotions and emotional dysregulation has probably been the thing that has cost me the most about ADHD. And that's kind of funny because it's not even a real criteria uh, for ADHD, but it's funny. Every adult with ADHD I know suffers from it. Interesting. Anyway, but I don't know enough to talk about it. So I brought an expert, uh, Renee, Renee Crook is on the ADA board. I get, I get the, as the president, I, I'm very lucky to get to work with all of the very best people. And uh, I've known Renee now for, oh my goodness, four years maybe or so, something like that. And, and, and she's been serving on the board for, it only seems like forever, but it's probably a couple of years. Uh, close enough. Uh, <laughs> year, a year and nine months. <laughs> year and nine months. See, there you go. And uh, uh, so she's been doing a great job and she runs all of our support groups, but uh, she really has an expertise in uh, executive function and, and especially in the emotional regulation. And I've uh, heard her speak on this before. And there's just some, some really great information. Now, I know you're wondering what on earth uh, are, why are we talking about this here when this is supposed to be about finances and, and why, why would we work with Renify? So it, it, it's rather interesting. I was, I was speaking with Rick uh, before and, and we sort of came to the conclusion that, you know, most of everybody's money problems are caused by emotional decisions. Uh, when when you have emotional problems, that's what causes the money problems in many, many cases. I can't imagine how many jobs I have lost for emotional reasons, getting mad at somebody and quitting, uh, yelling at somebody and getting fired. Uh, you know, that'll affect your finances, making dumb decisions because you felt like it or you wanted to uh, recover from some situation. So anyway. What uh, ADA and Renify are partners because at ADA, we know that adults with ADHD are affected by ADHD in many, many parts of their lives. And Renify knows that adults with ADHD are affected by in, in many, many parts of their lives. So Renify works on the finances. And if you come to Renify to get help with your finances, you can go to ADA to get help with all the other stuff. And 
at Ada, we know that you can come here and get help for a lot of things, but if you want help with your finances, you really should go to a specialist, and that's why we work with Renafly. So, but now I want to hand this over to, um, to Renee for the most part. I'm going to ask her questions because, well, I invited her, so I get to ask some of these questions. But you'll have plenty of opportunity to, uh, to ask questions at all. Uh, uh, as we go along as well. And don't, you don't, don't feel like you have to hold them to the end. I'll slip my questions in there, not a problem. But let's go back over to Renee. So Renee Crook is, a, is an ADHD coach. She's also an expert in um, helping, especially beginners, I guess, uh, deal with their ADHD and the emotional turmoil of that. And of course, emotional dysregulation is what they're coping with. But let's, the first question I had on my list is, what is emotional dysregulation? I mean, I know now, but when I was first diagnosed, I didn't know for a long time even that that was a thing and I, I blew up all the time, but, but what exactly is emotional dysregulation? So it's basically a, you know, a, an upset to the, the ability of us to keep ourselves either calm or regulated, meaning uh, aware of our emotions, able to choose uh, and not be in survival or reactive mode. And so when we have emotional dysregulation is when that is feels and it can be out of our control um, in the moment. Uh, you can get blindsided by things. And, and so it's basically just being out of control in a way, not, not literally consciously aware of your emotions in the moment. Um, and it's uh, as the description of this webinar talks about, is it? It's actually it's not listed in the DSM criteria for ADHD anymore. It used to be, um, it was removed not because it's not a problem anymore, because it's so complex and confusing, <laughs> and where humans and emotions are messy and they're hard to study, um, unfortunately. And so they have removed it because it's harder to qualify. But it is one of the most um, confounding impacts of ADHD that isn't talked about nearly enough. So that's why we're here. <laughs> okay. Cool. Okay. So, and, and, and now it sounds like you have, you don't have control of your emotions. I, I immediately think temper tantrum, blowing up. Mm -hmm. Is, is there another kind? Do, do people get, do they blow up happy? Do they get really super quiet and Tell me about that. It can show up in a lot of ways. And I think that's what was really interesting about thinking about the idea of this, because most people mo uh, think about or, or uh, describe it in the way that you did is how you experience it with your ADHD and meaning uh, it can be more externally obvious to, your, to right. those around you. <laughs> um, and, and, and oh, it's pretty obvious. <laughs> <laughs> spill over in all kinds of ways um and so but but so yes yeah, so the external outbursts it could be anger it could be um it could be crying it could be uh extreme excitement it, it could be positive and you know dysregulated in a positive way where people are just like literally bouncing off the walls with excitement or speaking a mile a minute um, but it also can be where how it shows up for me, which is with, um, and I have a, primarily an attentive type ADHD and a, lo a lot of other reasons, but um, being female too, we tend to, uh, stereotypically, we tend to internalize a lot more. Um, so I turn it inward um, on myself and many uh, people do uh, when they either, it's not socially appropriate, they know it's not socially appropriate or they're socialized to not speak out or speak, uh, express that. So it can be internalized and the danger of that uh, over time without learning how to deal with it is it actually uh, increases the risk of depression and other um, mood disorders or other anxiety disorders because it's being suppressed and, and turned inward. And then it turns into lots of other things which we're gonna talk about more, but negative self-talk and shame and judgment and rejection sensitivity and all these other pieces that are directly connected to emotional dysregulation that are really problematic. And probably ulcers and high blood pressure, which I know I've had. That too, uh, <laughs> there's a lot of stress-related disorders that come from yeah, internalizing our stress and uh, physiological reactions like upset stomach and other kinds of you know, intestinal problems and <laughs> headaches and migraines and shoulder pains and body aches, and it can manifest in a lot of ways physically. Okay, so it affects your body. What about your, your life? Does it have an impact out in your life? What's the, uh, so I, I, you know, I've quit and, or been fired. So we know about that, but what other sort of impacts might it have? 
Um, there are a lot of challenges that people face in relationships. Uh, so meaning that if, if I'm, if you are uh, emotionally dysregulated, that can show up with being short tempered. It can be um, kind of snippy language. It could be a hair trigger sort of reaction or extreme sensitivity to judgments or criticism. It could be impacting. And so when you're in that position, if you have a partner in your life that you spend a lot of time with, um, they can generally uh, catch the brunt of that um, unintentionally or without being able to, or, or you know, kind of, again, the re- well, <laughs> spill over of, 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 of the impact. It can show up in problems in relationships at work. Like you said, you know, being able to work with your coworkers, but also be directed or corrected or um, dealing with perceptions of criticism in the, in the workplace. Um, it can show up in uh, like another external manifestation that causes a lot of problems for people is physical aggression. So they could get into a fight, they could get into an accident, they could have road rage, um, they may end up arrested, they may end up with other things, we, and we may end up using you know, coping strategies that are not self-medicating, that are not so helpful. Right. Um, and it can also just turn into people pleasing for those of us who turn it inside. Um, we can tend to uh, disconnect from people to protect others from ourselves or to protect us from others. Right. We can close up, clam up, um, wall ourselves off to protect ourselves from it, all of these feelings. Um, there's, yeah, there's so many ways it shows up that, um, that can be problematic um, for people when they don't know, aren't aware it's happening or they don't know what to right. do. So I'm gonna, so there's, we've talked a lot about emotions and ADHD. And then, so now I wonder, because when I think about an emotional issue, like a, a mental, men, mental anything and emotion, I think bipolar, I think depression, uh, you know, specific conditions. If, if we're that wildly emotional, is it just ADHD or should we be looking at something else? And are they connected? And um, yeah, I think that actually, um, this is a pretty complex piece, but uh, honestly, many people uh, get diagnosed incorrectly first, or sometimes correctly. It can, this is kind of a tricky slope, but slippery slope for some people. So most, a lot of women are, are diagnosed with, AD, with depression or anxiety before they're ever even, the topic of ADHD comes up. Um, anxiety disorders look like um, rejection sensitivity. So people who may have all of the, they may be diagnosed with a social anxiety disorder because they talk about how it feels to be going out into a group or anticipating a social event and that could be true if it's pervasive over all situations, all environments, or really common, or it's like it's persistent. Um, and and uh, uh, anyway, so it's, it's, it's about extremes for some people, but it's also about specific experiences. There's lots of anxiety disorders that are also very specific. But with, with it, um, ADHD and emotional dysregulation, it is... Um, I don't know anybody with ADHD that doesn't deal with it. Um, right. It doesn't deal with emotional dysregulation on some level. Um, it's connected to the prefrontal cortex, which is where our executive functions are um, and, and which are the functions that help us run our lives, make decisions, um, regulate ourselves. Emotions are in a different part of the brain, but it, it's still, um, it's decision-making and thinking and planning and all of that are all in the prefrontal cortex, which are all in uh, ADHD is, is uh, impact is a manifestation of challenges in all of those areas. Um, but uh, I think that the way that you can tell the difference is really um, like to be between that and depression, for example, is that no matter whether something's good or bad, you, when you're depressed, you tend to see everything kind of negatively. Um, the whole world is sort of painted that way. Okay. It's longstanding. It doesn't go away. Um, with emotional dysregulation, it's it's like it can be a roller coaster ride, not the fun kind. Um, you know, where you're you're up and down, blindsided. You can be happy one minute and really overwhelmed and sad the next, and and that also can be a mood disorder. So it's very tricky. So so making sure that you have a good uh, educated provider is really important, but it's really about um, the ability for you to get yourself back on track and to be regulated again and, and have strategies that do help. If, if none of those strategies or other interventions or supports don't work, then you really probably want to be looking at another diagnosis um, more deep, 
deep uh, differential diagnosis to eliminate any of these other mood or, or um, disorders that are not diagnoses that are beyond or often coexist with ADHD. So they could also be there, but that right. isn't, isn't just connected to emotional dysregulation of general ADHD for most people. Okay. Okay. So, um, so we had a question in the, in the chat and somebody was asking, it's like, uh, you know, when we compare us to non ADHDers, I guess the ADHD really, well, you've kind of already answered that question, uh, why we're more emotional than they are. And I guess it's the sort of the, the swings are, are higher and also the lack of impulse control probably might have something to do with it. Well, yeah, for some people, I mean, for me, this is again why I love talking about talking with this uh, about ADHD with you is that we have very different manifestations of our ADHD. I have yes. almost no impulsivity in me at all, um, and sometimes I wish I did, <laughs> um, <laughs> because I overthink everything. It takes forever to make decisions, and I worry about stuff and ruminate uh, about some things uh, not as much as I used to. But um, but I think uh, so. It's very different in that sense where I wish that I had more and no hyperactivity either. So yeah, that that would be really helpful sometimes uh, to get myself going. But uh, if I could control it that way and pick and choose, of course, would be amazing. But, um, but I think that, you know, thinking about how we uh, describe or deal with, um, oh, I lost my train of thought on, on that story. I got myself off track. Uh, what was your question? What was the question again? Oh, you th I wasn't supposed to remember it. And I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I normally don't. Yeah, I'm usually doing pretty good with that. But <laughs> no, that, 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 that's absolutely fine. Um, Okay, so um, comparing us to to non ADHD oh, yeah. was was the thing. So there's there's you and I who are two very different types of not of ADHDers, but the yeah. non ADHDer who just seems to stay calm all the time or or on a pretty even keel. Let's say I suppose they do get mad and and happy and and whatever, but it just seems to pale in comparison sometimes to my emotions. I think that, yeah, thank you for reminding me of that. I think the biggest thing around that is, um, I mean, there's neurochemical reasons why if we think about, you know, oops, why ADHD, what ADHD is connected to is, you know, uh, neurotransmitter deficiencies and functionality in the brain. So we don't have enough of, or the right, um, some of the transmitters in our brain are not there. So they're not, messages aren't getting sent. And one of them is it having enough of the right kinds of chemicals in our brain. So serotonin and dopamine um, and these other neurotransmitters that help us regulate ourselves. Um, they are either deficient or not sufficient sometimes or produced in enough amounts in the right amounts or overused in some areas inefficiently. So we just don't have them on demand demand like neurotypical people would. So that's, and that's part of, I guess, thinking about back to the definition of emotional dysregulation or the cause is it, why we are feel more and seem to be on more of a hair trigger on some of those things is because we don't have as much of those on board to process them correctly. We, we, there, I'm not going to, there's, you know, I'm not a, a doctor, so I'm not going to go too deeply into it, but, but there's really, it's, it, it's a, it's definitely neurochemical. And so when those aren't there enough, we have to structure external uh, and use other strategies to help keep us uh, regulated um, because we do are tend to be more sensitive and more emotionally uh, impacted by things around us positively and negatively. It's not all negative. I mean, we can be super excited about all kinds of things really easily. Actually, it's, it's funny that you bring that up because I do and, and have gotten myself into trouble about that. Um, it's not just that I lose my temper. I also get excited about things and, and I bet you many people in the audience will will relate to this. I see business opportunities and will invest in them without a thorough analysis, shall mm -hmm. we say? <laughs> oh my God, we're gonna be rich. Ah, here's all my money. Take it. Let's yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you know, an, another good reason to be speaking at Renify is uh, <laughs> uh, you know it it's very the, the emotional outbursts or over enthusiasm or, or uh, impulsivity that can be related when your emotions are out of control uh, can be very detrimental to you. Um, so just if you're struggling with that, you, you want to work on your emotions and you want to work on your money, just so you know. <laughs> uh, I have a few questions here uh, and I think they're all kind of related and they are going to uh, run one into the other. So uh, uh, somebody was asking just 
what remedies can you practice to overcome these emotional outbursts? And we're going to talk about that in just a minute. Uh, but because we're going to, you're going to get some of them here, but the, the next two questions are kind of related to once we've talked, where do they go next? And somebody said, okay, so can you, are there books you can read to learn how to control your emotions? Um, that would be interesting. And, or is one-to-one -one coaching the best way to learn emotional regulation? Or do you need a therapist and they have to go lay on a couch and blame everything on your mother? Like what? It, <laughs> I know that's a bunch of questions all at, all at once, but um, so, so I took let's talk about, okay, where else could we learn about our controlling our emotions? Uh, beyond this, and then we'll look at some solutions with you. Okay. Um, so first, I mean, first and foremost, for, you know, for anybody, um, I would just self-reflection, which again is one of the challenges of ADHD and uh, executive functioning challenges uh, is, you know, metacognition, thinking about our own thinking and self being self-aware is a problem for a lot of us. Um, so, but it's possible to build the skill and to get support around it. So first it's really just starting to, by paying attention to what's happening. And now that you know, this is a thing, this is a thing of ADHD. Um, it, uh, it can open, answer so many questions because there's so much judgment when you don't know what the thing is or that it's related to ADHD that you're somehow just, you know, mean or mean. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you're disrespectful or insensitive or, you know, <laughs> narcissistic or, I mean, there's all kinds of things that can come up around being lacking uh, empathy or, you know, all of these things that can happen for some of us with ADHD can be, can be accused of these things um, and or ourselves, you know, thinking, well, I just am a hothead. I can't, I'm totally out of control. I'm acting like a child or, you know, there's all these things people say about themselves or are said, spoken about. So first, um, just starting with that, paying attention to what's happening, you know, noticing that it, that it is, is it a thing for you um, and how big of a deal it is, is it? Um, checking in with other people around you. So asking it, if you're, you gotta be ready to hear the answers and hope that they can say yeah. it kindly and compassionately. But, um, you know, if you're vulnerable and you ask in a way that that's helpfully saying, hey, I'm really thinking this is a thing, what do you notice? And hopefully they, they can see the compassion and not just like laugh in your face that oh yeah duh, really like have you not noticed this is a thing well no apparently i haven't um so help me out here um and then uh you know i think so that's one place so so within yourself to start there really because all of it comes in, and we're going to keep coming back to this because this is really ultimately you are the only person who has control over this you're the only person that can change this that can be responsible for it or do anything about it because it's it's inside you um but you but you, most people can't do it alone um, so checking in with uh, somebody you trust and love that can be honest with you, but kind and compassionate um, to help see your own behaviors, generally help remind you or point out when maybe something's happening that you might be dysregulated, that you don't know it. They can see your, probably your people in your life know your triggers probably better than you do. They know what sets you off. They know what might, they might help give you some insight as to what's happening. Um, you can go to coaches. Um, this is actually one of my specialties, talking about emotional dysregulation and talking about rejection sensitivity, which we're gonna talk a little bit more about. Um, and uh, so you can go to uh, maybe even support groups talk about this. We lead support groups with ADA um, that talk about emotional dysregulation and how do you deal with that in relationships or by yourself or at work. Those are all places you can get support around that. One-on-one -on -one coaching, group coaching, therapy is a great place if it becomes, if, if you find out that your triggers are connected to your childhood or other um, long held stories or beliefs um, about how you see yourself in the world and how you relate to people or how you see your risk physically. People, a lot of people who also have big problems with this tend to also have trauma. Some kind of trauma in their childhood or life. So there's another compounding factor for many of us that we do need therapy to support healing. Um, but and then um, medication is another option. People you know, go to doc can go to doctors and talk about emotional dysregulation, but most of them don't understand it, unfortunately. So it's a little bit iffy. Yeah, that sounds like the, you're going to end up with uh, medication for depression rather than medication for ADHD. Yeah, it's very, um, very likely yeah. that you may get not get exactly what you need. So I that's kind of, in my mind, one of the, the later resources. <laughs> right. 
Right. But if, I mean, if you're having extreme rages and you are out of control, you know, physically or emotionally, and you're at risk, like for other things, like severe consequences, like accidents or harming yourself or somebody else or getting arrested, then, you know, maybe medication right away is an, is an option for those people because you need to cut back that impulse, impulsiveness um, and that emotional dysregulation. But uh, that is out of con literally out of control for more severe on the more extreme case because all of us are on a spectrum with our symptoms and with some people with emotional dysregulation. It's a small impact. Um, it impacts them every day in different ways, but the consequences are different. Like I said, for me, mine are more internalized. So yeah. they're not, I'm not going to get arrested because of my emotional dysregulation or I'm not going to do something crazy that is going to cause me uh, some of these other things. I'm just going to like in internally combust <laughs> and you know, I'm going to destroy myself, but it's not going to be obvious to everybody <clears throat> immediately. <laughs> and my mother always used to say, if you're going to die, die quietly. And that, <laughs> that's what you would do. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> that's, that's not good, but okay. I know. It's, yeah, um, it's not great. It's just, it has different impacts. <laughs> right on. Okay. Um, we have a, a question. What's the science behind it? Now you hinted at it before with the uh, the neurotransmitters in the brain, and they're they're not working probably I, uh, properly. I I don't know if we want to get into more detail than that. It's not like there's a pill you can take or something more. You know, you're not eating enough broccoli or something that'll give you more neurotransmitters that'll that'll solve that problem. So it it the underlying root of ADHD is those neurotransmitter problems in the brain. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't think we can sort of delve uh, deeper into that really without uh, many more years of study and, and doctors involved and, and all that kind of stuff. So we'll take that as answered. I, I had a good uh, question here. This is interesting because so the, the emotional irregularity and stuff uh, you you mentioned you're not going to get arrested i've i've been arrested you've you know you're not going to do i've had i've written off four cars uh i've done just the emotional dysregulation is has been very costly for me but uh can emotional irregularity cause or produce promiscuity or risky emotional vulnerability yeah think so I think that's I mean there's a couple of reasons that drive that for people um, it, it so impulsivity is connected to emotional dysregulation so yeah if you're dealing with you know emotional dysregulation doesn't always show up as impulsivity so that's why I, we've been talking about these different sides of emotional dysregulation um, it's just an imbalance of emotions basically you know you are you know it, right. you're kind of more free free on it's a free-for-all on the, on the emotional uh, you know uh, train at that point but but I think, um, so yes, it can in the sense that you are either, you're not thinking about, um, you're not in, in a thinking mode. You're not in a problem solving mode. Your prefrontal cortex, your thinking brain is not on board um, or it's not in charge. It might be there, but, but these other areas of the brain might be lighting it up, you know, and, and directing you more, which would be, you know, based on uh, what's right in front of you. So something that's right at hand and, and that's interesting or motivating, more motivating than the consequences potentially, or consequences don't often even come into play for people who are people who are emotionally dysregulated that they can't, they aren't thinking about the future. They're in survival mode. That's the part of the brain that the kind of primal brain, the amygdala that is, is kind of just in, you know, functioning, you are surviving and you're, you're solving, you know, moving forward and doing whatever you're doing and whatever thing is in front of you that feels the most, um, compelling at the moment is going to get your attention. And so that could be uh, show up for you in, in, in some promiscuity or other emotional uh, vulnerability that could get you in trouble. It's usually also connected to other things. So um, where again, where you may have had some other experiences in your life that make you more likely to put yourself in risky situations or make it okay for you to be, you know, kind of putting myself later, you know, putting other people in front of me or thinking about their needs. It's not, that's not necessarily just connected to ADHD. There's usually other, other historical things in our lives that make us more likely to do things like that um, or just undervalue our own safety or health or emotional safety in those moments because we aren't thinking in the future. That's right, we're right. thinking right now. So we can't think about what's going to, the impact going to be on future me 
that's not Absolutely. doesn't exist right now. That's right now. And so part of it is ADHD related in that sense where working memory doesn't come into play where you're like, ah, or if it's happened before, right? The repeated thing that we do as ADHDers or people around us are like, why you're doing the same thing again? Like, why, how are you here again? And not thinking that it's going to be any different outcome than the last time you were here. Well, because I can't remember that I was here before or what happened or how I got here or why, what I should have done differently because I'm in the moment right now and not thinking, not pulling that stuff back. You can do it. It just takes effort. So I never saw this that way before I, I, I was more associated with my, my impulsivity, but of course I met my wife on a blind date and proposed to her one month later, which may be emotional, you know, whatever. Anyway, 36 years later, we're still married. So right, it say, worked there out. There's something in there. We got to trust your intuition as an ADHD or two. There, there you go. There's some of so that. There's, you know, <laughs> so there's that. Okay. Um, <laughs> Sometimes it works uh, in our favor, for sure. It really does. Well, that, that, that's it. That's it. Uh, so uh, here's a good question. Emotion. So, so we're all emotional all the time. Uh, you, know, uh, you know, we sort of hover around a, an average sort of level, I guess. And we're, so, but we're up and down. But I mean, there's always emotion. I can't imagine a time that you know, there's not some emotion. Sure. Uh, if not, then that's a whole different conversation. <laughs> I, yes, I suppose. So uh, the question is here, are there scales or measures or self-assessment that can help identify what particular sort of emotional regulation disorder we have? Oh, that's a great question. You know, um, I, there probably is. I don't know of one that's specifically just emotional dysregulation. There are um, descriptions often more like, sadly, they are more commonly used to describe children. Um, there are in um, scales that you can help kind of determine where you are um, emotionally in that sense. I mean, that's really more of a, like a litmus test of, okay, well, you know, how am I, you know, they talk about zones of regulation and, um, you know, kind of, am I in common regulated? There's lots of, there's different, lots of research that's, and, and materials that are focused on children. Um, there aren't a lot about adults. Um, and uh, and I don't know if there is one. Honestly, I don't know the answer. That's a great question. I'd love to find out. I will be finding the answer out, though. Um, I just didn't think about it because it's really, um, it's been something that's been so I personal, uh, interpersonal, like with my clients and talking to them about what how it manifests for them because it is so different. Um, and there's, there is skills for executive functioning that, um, that, that I use. Um, and there's uh, several out there um, that help you determine how much emotional dysregulation is a problem in the grand scheme of all your other executive functions. Um, so the Bar there's a Barclay scale and the Dawson and Guare are two writers that work with children and students with ADHD that have executive functioning um, um, uh, measures uh, for adults as well as children. Right. So those are places to do that. I don't know if there's one just for emotional dysregulation. Though I, that'd be interesting to find out. So that brings up this another question. Um, we're not talking about the presence or absence of emotion. So our the the problem then in in ADHD is is more of a a degree. It's it's magnified. Uh, way too much, uh, way too little, uh, you know, veering off of sort of a, 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 an even keel, we could say. Does that, is, is that what we're talking about here? It's more magnifying than it is presence or absence. Correct. It's generally a yeah, scale or a magnification of, uh, of uh, um, emotion, uh, the roller coaster ride that we were talking about before. Right on. Okay. Um, Oh, here's a good one. How does emotional dysregulation affect getting organized? <laughs> oh, wow. Oh, so much. So in so many ways. Um, well, this is also connected to, you know, which we haven't talked a lot about yet, but one of the most important factors around emotional dysregulation is self-talk. Um, and when you're talking about organization, um, 
it's not the act of organizing. Like none of us are born hating to organize things um, it, it, <laughs> that I know of anyway. Um, uh, Cause we generally, there's a lot of kids who even like order, you know, my, my nephew would, you know, organize all the blocks and line everything up from a very young age. And I could care less. I was, I was a tornado when I was a baby, things were everywhere um, and loved it, the, everything mixed together. Um, so I think that uh, when you think about um, organization or managing things, again, that's an executive function, but it comes with so much emotional baggage um, from lack of internal knowledge around how do I actually organize things that there's an executive functions are not inherently known. People don't really know that that's a truth, but they aren't. We don't, we aren't born. We are born with some basic executive functions, but organization, managing time, um, you know, things like that for those of us with ADHD, time awareness even knowing and feeling the passage of time accurately uh, is, is a thing for it's, it doesn't, most of us don't have that as ADHDers. Um, and we have to be explicitly taught these things and we aren't often um, to the degree we need to uh, and have repetition where we're not going to just watch somebody else organize something and know how to do it and do it ourselves the next time. Most of us, some of us can, who are very visual learners or things like that. But, um, but we generally, um, talk ourselves out of uh, and get totally overwhelmed by the idea of organizing anything, or um, we just don't know how to do it often. We th people think we should know, we think we should know, um, but we've actually never explicitly been taught a way that makes sense to our brain. So, you know, when you're thinking about that, emotional dysregulation comes into play because you're most likely, you'll get started on it and then you will get fit decision fatigue, not know what to do with anything, get overwhelmed and flooded, don't know what to do next, give up or, you know, make, you know, do, which I, I'm not going to, I don't want to be dropping names of anybody necessarily, but an organizational style theory that you're just supposed to pull everything out of your house and organize it like, and then put it all back where it belongs. As for most ADHD years, that's an absolute nightmare. It'll just never, it'll just stay there. It'll just be, it'll be a pile and I'll be overwhelmed and I'm just, you know, the closet's exploded and it's just going to stay there for three months. I, cause I just can't deal with it. That's just too much. Um, and so that's where the emotional dysregulation comes in, where we may not know how to keep ourselves calm to proceed through a task or make decisions or talk right. ourselves into keeping going. Like there's so many ways that that is impacted by emotional dysregulation. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Um, okay. So uh, obviously uh, emotional dysregulation is going to affect a lot of different areas in your life, including, as, uh, as we pointed out, finances. Welcome, Rick, by the way. I shared earlier how we were talking about um, most of our finance problems somewhere originate in an emotional breakdown of, of some sort. And, and uh, you just, just tonight, we've already talked about quitting jobs, yelling at somebody, uh, probably divorce is a very uh, costly, uh, has a lot of effects. Uh, I've invested foolishly in business ideas because I was overly enthusiastic. So uh, if it's affected your finances, yes, deal with the emotions, but you're going to need to uh, talk to Renify about dealing with the, the finances as well. Um, so, uh, I, and let me ask you, Renee, uh, I just want to get the, the best sort of idea about how we'd like to proceed for the next 20 minutes, because I, I love to answer all these questions, but one of the earlier questions was, how are we going to deal with this? And I don't want to run out of time. Yeah. So how can I, an ADHD or prone to emotional dysregulation, how can I control myself? I have no, and I'll warn you right up front, I have no willpower. So it's not going to be just, well, just don't lose your temper. That's not going to be a good answer. <laughs> well, yeah, well you, you just threw out one of my, my, my hot button words. Willpower is a dirty word in my mind um, <laughs> as an ADHD coach. Um, because for most of us, it really doesn't exist because uh, it isn't about will. It's not about not wanting it. It's a judgment statement for most of us that we, we either we're willfully not doing something or willfully choosing not to do these things or work on ourselves or pay attention to our emotions. And, and it, that's just not the case. So that's one of the biggest misconceptions and the most pain for uh, those of us with ADHD and the uh, people who don't understand it um, is that, you know, if you just try harder, if you just, if you just, if you just, and I was like, if I just could, I would have already done it already. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but so what, what I would 
what I find really helpful, and this is something that's so deeply personal to me, and that's why I, you know, for, for me, this, this, uh, the work that comes with it, uh, with dealing with emotional dysregulation, and it's m impacts for me emotionally because of the internalization of it and these other ways that it manifests for me, it sort of, it eats away at the heart of who we are and how we see ourselves, our confidence, our self-esteem, our self-perception, our ability and willingness to engage in, in connecting with new people because we just don't know how we're going to react or we can't trust ourselves to react or respond in the way that's socially appropriate. Or I mean, there's so many ways this impacts who we are and how we see ourselves. It fundamentally changes how we see ourselves and how we feel about ourselves when we don't understand our emotional dysregulation and our ADHD. Um, and tied to this uh, is really about the back to the self-awareness. So the, the most important thing um, that I found for me and I think for anybody else is again, just like with any other aspect of ADHD, we can research a certain topic of ADHD or, or you know, know enough to write our own book about it, but that doesn't mean that we know how to necessarily apply it to our own you know, our own lives, or how do I make this true for me, or how do I deal with it? So, or, uh, um, well, even for me, when I was first diagnosed, I was diagnosed as an adult um, as well, that uh, I didn't see myself represented. My type of ADHD as, and as a woman wasn't represented uh, in the, in a lot of books or out there anywhere. I mean, I was an educator at the time, and it was, even then it was, you know, still the hyperactive little boy bouncing off the chair, falling out of the chair, you know, interrupting all the time in class. That was sort of the, what you would hear. And, and I knew that that couldn't be true, um, but didn't see it. So anyway, I think the same thing is true for this is looking at your own ADHD, paying attention to finding out what's happening. So again, like I said before, when you have, you know, that it's impacting you, figuring out how, what's happening? What are, what are my biggest problems? And, you know, not overwhelming yourself with too many things, but kind of probably looking at what's, what are the big things? What, what is causing me the most pain in my life? Um, what are people constantly talking to me about? Or am I getting criticized or judged for? Or what kind of comments are people making about me? Well, you know, those usually aren't a, totally innocuous. There's usually something in that. If a lot of people are saying the same thing about you or shows up in all of your work environments, there's this one thing they all say, it's probably something to that you want to look at. So starting there and then. Um, so for example, just, just, so for, I've noticed one of the things that helped me with my temper is I've noticed that I, I can feel myself getting hot mm -hmm. before it happens. Yeah. So let's say that I've now I'm, I feel myself getting hot. What do I do? Breathing first. Run away. <laughs> breathing breathing. First. okay. Because um, honestly, that, that's again, back to the primal brain. When we are in a dysregulated state, our survival brain is in charge at that moment. Our thinking brain is offline. Our emotional brain is actually offline too. This is something new in research I've recently been reading about is that, you know, that there, there is actual, um, the emotional centers of the brain shut down when you're in fight, flight, or freeze mode, when you are in a triggered survival mode. And many of us when, with ADHD who are in this space, our brain thinks we're actually at risk. It, it, react, it looks the same on brain scans um, as somebody who is physically in danger when we perceive we're in danger. So our physiology responds the same way. Our brain thinks that we're in danger. It's hard. It's almost indistinguishable um, between a real threat and a perceived threat, especially when it's chronic. When we have, as ADHDers, we live in this chronic heightened state a lot um, and uh, are on a high alert a lot. Uh, so it shows up in lots of ways. But anyway, so you have to calm yourself down. You have to bring that thinking brain back on board and tell the brain that's trying to protect you, fight, fight or freeze, you know, freeze or any of these uh, modes that we get into that you're really okay. I'm not, I'm not, I'm okay right now. And some people need to just say that too. And, and, but, but breathing um, and slowing breath, parasympathetic breathing is a kind of breathing that uh, it's uh, longer exhales than inhales. So breathing in, you know, for seven, there's lots of different ways you can do this, but it depends on how your, your lung capacity, so you might need to build up to it. But, you know, breathing in for seven counts, for example, holding it for seven counts, and then breathing out for 11 is one example. Seven, 11 breathing it, um, is one of the models for mindful breathing or, or restorative breathing, because it's actually, uh, it's cleansing the breath and bringing the back to a calming state, bringing the parasympathetic nervous system back on board. 
and calming the body. So that's one. Um, and you might need to do that multiple times. So hyperventilating breathing or just, you know, breathing really quickly is, is going to make it worse. So really paying attention to counting and having some sort of a, a doing it enough that you actually can do it without a lot of thought is really helpful. Um, My mother used to say count to 10 and we'd go, one of the three, four, six, 10. Right. <laughs> That's not gonna help. Not, yeah. not gonna help, um, no. <laughs> and so just keep doing that until you actually start to be able to think again. Like, I mean, really, if you're racing, if your brain is going, if you're, you're flushed, your heart is racing, um, your stomach is upset and you have a pit, you know, all these things in your stomach and you can't even think, breathing, big, big, big. So um, primal. And then um, paying attention to what's happening in your head because our emotions are triggered by our thoughts and our, right. um, so there's many of us, especially at the beginning are not aware of what we say to ourselves. We're not aware of the dialogue that's happening or the monologue or the whatever, however many voices are happening in your head. There are a lot of, of com competing thoughts that can be happening. There can be this kind of really, really overwhelming flood of thoughts, emotions and worries or fears or anger or any of these things. And we tend to be replaying stuff that somebody said, something that happened to us, how we've been victimized, how we've been, pro you know, we've been, you know, or, or how terrible we are, or how much of a, you know, a screw up we might be, or any of these things, there's something that we're saying or repeating or believing that's feeding that emotional flare up again. It's okay. just like, so paying attention. So we to have that. to stop that, otherwise it's just going to keep going. Right. So first yeah. you have to be aware of what you're even saying. And then until then, until you're calm, until you've slowed down, you can't even then analyze that or pay attention. So I think that's one of the pieces that's really important to be looking at that. And then, um, and that stuff drives us. And then finally, it's really um, the basics of all of this. Honestly, we haven't talked about it, but preventing it in the first place is really, really key. And those main, main, main things are sleep. Uh, sleep for people with ADHD uh, is the number one impactor of emotional dysregulation of any other thing you could do. Food, what, you, what you're eating, um, and, uh, and for many people, exercise. So those are the, the biggest, but sleep is huge. If you, you'll, you'll notice as you start paying attention that the days that you have less sleep, you're going to be more triggered. You're going to have more trouble with impulsivity or forgetting things or making mistakes, or you're just, it's just setting us up for more emotional dysregulation. Um, if you have stress in your life, um, I think this is another thing. I had a personal experience of this last week of having a big, really, really hard thing happen in my life. And all of these things that I had been sort of feeling like I got under control with my emotional regulation and my, you know, ADHD management, where I was on the roller coaster. Not so much. Yeah. I was on the roller coaster. And so I had to pay attention and tap into what I knew to um, everything was going to be harder. I knew I was, everything was going to be harder. And I had to mitigate that. I had to set myself up for support and get, I'm getting more sleep. I'm eating, you know, making sure I'm paying attention to what I'm eating, all these things. I'm getting, talking to people. There's a lot of things I'm doing. So it's really important because it really, um, it just makes everything harder. Um, Interesting. What you just said there is that we're, um, you're not doing it alone. Right. Um, you're getting help. You're getting support. You're, you're doing things like that. It's a, there's a great question here. Um, what's the best way to explain the emotional dysregulation? And, you know, because you, you've got to explain this to the people that it's going to, like, you know, I've had to apologize to my boss, uh, co-workers, my family, of course, uh, random people in the store. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so is, is there a way that you can explain this? And, and I would say, I mean, some people, you, you, you might just hope you never see them again. Although if you live in a small town, that might be a problem. Uh, but, but how, how can you explain this and ask for help? That would be a really good one too. I think the biggest challenge, and this is probably where people find this the most pr problematic when they do reach out to talk to people around them is that many people around them, their first response will be that you're making excuses that you're making, you know, using your ADHD as an excuse. Um, so be prepared for that if you haven't already had that conversation. I hope it doesn't happen to you, but it happens more often than I would like. So it's probably right. going to happen. But I think having, you know, having somebody listen to a presentation like this, for example, reading about symptoms of ADHD, reading about, so you can say, hey, this is, and I'm not saying be, 
Mm. This is the tricky part. So explaining it as opposed to it being an excuse. My ADHD, part of ADHD is emotional dysregulation, which makes it harder for me to pay attention to my emotions, regulate my emotions. I get more impacted by things around me or when things are surprises or when I haven't slept or when things are changed on me suddenly, or, I mean, we didn't talk about that, but that's one of the things that can really set, you know, struggle for people with ADHD is, you know, big change, you know, sudden changes or distractions or things that had happened differently than they expect. Um, when your expectations don't meet the reality, those are a big thing for many of us with ADHD. Um, so I think that uh, being able to uh, pay attention to those are super important and um, being able to think about what is it that I, um, what do I need uh, right now and, and explaining it in the best, most objective way you can, but personal. So, and, and giving them an example. So if you've decided or you've figured out that when your partner um, interrupts you in the middle of doing something that you're super focused on and they come in and they interrupt you and you blow up um, or you snap their head off or you. Uh, I do them, that, by the way. Yes. You know, any of those things. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, then you can help educate them about what's happening for you and say, hey, I noticed that when you interrupt me, I get. Or have you noticed that they probably have, <laughs> they have, have yeah. you noticed that when you interrupt me, this happens and, and instead of blaming them, just saying, Hey, well, that what's actually happening is, you know, it's because I'm being surprised because I'm hyper-focused. I'm so intent on this thing. My, you know, many of us with ADHD who tend to hyper-focus have really quick startle responses, which is also part of our primal protective brain. Um, we're wired for, for saving and protecting oh, yeah. and being on alert. So there's, again, this is a, this is an evolutionary balance, you know, benefit, but it's also problematic when it's not necessary or needed. Um, being able to perceive real threat is the problem. Um, the, of dysregulation is we, we, we it's hard, discerning what's real threat and what's not, what's perceived threat is part of this, this uh, piece. But anyway, so I think that being able to say to your partner or anybody around you, um, when you do this, this happens to me or not even that. I notice when I'm in this situation, my, I tend to react this way and I'm trying to become aware of it, but it would be really great if, you know, you right. could do something, you know, whatever, problem solve together, you know, some way that, explain the impact first and then right talk now. about maybe what can we do differently so that you're not saying, Hey, don't do this. It bothers me. We got to take responsibility for what is it that we're willing to do to have on our end, um, be able to communicate. First of all, when we are dysregulated, be aware first that it's happening and then say, Hey, right now I just, I'm, I can tell I'm on I'm telling whatever you the code yep. word, you can say whatever you need to say, but whenever you have this experience, being able to share with your partner or whoever it is that you're having this relationship with a coworker or a boss or whoever, um, that that happens and you just need a minute or, you know, I, I just need to give me a second. I need to breathe or can you come back to me in a few minutes and I'll be ready to talk about this or whatever it is, but figuring out what right. it is you need and asking for it is really pivotal for making this different um, in okay. your life. Perfect. Okay. So now that we're talking about us and other people, because that's where it's going to come up. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a few questions on this and, and it, it was something we we're going to talk about anyway, is the, the whole uh, rejection sensitivity, uh, uh, what are the RSD? And, and so when, is that just emotional dysregulation about a specific thing? Is that more extreme? Is Emotional, uh, emotional sensitivity is directly connected, yeah, to emotional reg dysregulation. But so RSD, remote rejection sensitive dysphoria, is is a a, a a syndrome or a kind of a collection of experiences that have been named um, uh, was named or coined by uh, William Dodson, Dr. Dodson. Um, it is not in the diagnostic criteria um, or a diagnosable condition, but it is a noticed and experienced by, by almost all people with ADHD though. Um, but rejection sensitivity is a variation of rejection sensitive dysphoria where dysphoria is really like, again, where you're completely wrapped up in uh, impacted all areas of your life um, or in that moment anyway. Uh, it's, a, it's almost, it's, a, it's like a, a depressive state. It's a cha fully changed state. So rejection sensitivity is really just being more sensitive to rejection or the perception of rejection or being overly uh, sensitive to criticism. We can't, we may not hear, we may hear feedback as criticism or judgment, uh, framing it uh, and, it's, and it actually can be for many people physically 
um, painful. Uh, there's a physiological reaction or, or a worry. We can avoid certain situations um, or risk things that feel risky because of the, oh, it's just easier if I don't do that because I have no idea. They may laugh at me. They may um, think I'm not intelligent or professional. They may, uh, you know, I may mess up and then my world will be over and I won't be able to survive it. There's a real belief and feeling that it is catastrophic in our right. lives and that we will not be able to recover. In that moment, we feel like it is like the end of, of all things. And some people, literally, it's a, a, an absolute despair, dread that can happen. And other people, it's more like, oh, man, that's, what if, what if I, you know, if, if I say this, you know, what are they going to say? Are people going to laugh at me? I, people will choose not to speak up in meetings because they're afraid of how it might be perceived. Um, they won't find their, be able to find their voice or share their opinion um, because they're sure that it's going to be, dumb or they're going to be told that they're an idiot or they're going to get fired if they speak up or have an opinion about something. I mean, it, it runs all the different, the gamut of spectrum there, but it is, it is a, it's driven by beliefs um, and experiences that are, um, that you frame as dangerous, emotionally risky. Um, and in, most of the time it's based in previous experiences, but not always. Um, many of us have, have always felt this way, like that we've, even from a young age, we were extremely uh, sensitive to, uh, you know, criticism or judgment by our teachers or by our parents, um, and then just carry it. It becomes, we, we, we wear it like a cape for so long. Once it's been internalized, unfortunately, we, we replay that over and over and again, over again, and we deepen that belief that may, may or may not be true or we perceive something, this is the hardest part. This is the most confounding part for most people to understand that I may not have been actually physically uh, experienced or have a story about a rejection of a certain kind, but I may have seen somebody else experience it, or I may have heard that that's a thing that might happen if you're in this certain situation. And so then I'm gonna protect myself by, uh, not doing that thing. So <laughs> making sure that I don't fall into that trap that somebody else fell into and, 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 or, so it, it becomes real for me. It becomes like it actually happened sometimes. Not that I believe it happened, but that the phys it feels like it, well, that, that's going to happen, you know, or I had this one situation and as ADHDers, we tend to broad, do broad strokes of generalizations. Oh, so absolutely. It yeah. Happened in this one time it could possibly happen in all these times. So I'm just gonna, I'm, you know, there's a belief that it's gonna happen again, or if it's, if it happened once, it's certainly gonna happen five more times, you know, so that can be problematic because we then believe and we deepen the story that really was not a real thing in the first place. And we're very good at ruminating on something until it, like we will create a memory that, you know, yeah. So it's, 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 a, it's, um, yeah, it's pretty, it's a, it's a diabolical challenge of ADHD, the rejection sensitivity, and it, it is, um, uh, is really painful for many people to deal with. And, um, and just, but knowing again, first knowing that it's possible that that's what's happening. Um, and that when, you know, I've had a lot of experience with, with this in my own life and, and, and dealing with uh, it impacting my friendships and relationships more than anything else, because I would withdraw. So um, I would, because if, um, you know, for example, for many years before I knew about my ADHD, um, you know, I was always late for uh, parties or other things and people in my family would start lying to me about when the start time of a party was um, because they were tired of me being late and they knew if they just lied. I was consistently late. It, was, it wasn't, you know, it was usually a certain yeah. amount of time that I was late. So they would kind of bump it up. And, and but to me, that was mortifying. I was I didn't find that funny at all. I found it horrific. I found it embarrassing. I found it shameful. Um, and until I figured out how to be on time and what was causing me to be late, and it's one of my big ADHD wins is being on time for things, um, is that, you know, that for me though, um, it was my identity. The late, the person who was late and, and wasn't, wasn't respecting other people's times and was, you know, time and was insensitive or disrespectful or didn't care about this other thing because I was late. I internalized all that as my identity. That became who I saw, how I saw myself. And so then I would not necessarily, I wouldn't stand up and do things or speak up in a way that I, I would have if I didn't believe that I was this person in these moments of, of I'm, I'm a not, not caring person or I'm insensitive. And I knew on one level that wasn't true, but 
I, but I, I didn't behave that way because I believed it enough of myself, believed it that right, I, right. I didn't, you know, anyway. So it, it just, it really is, it changes who we are. Okay. So obviously it's possible to make progress yes. on that. There's hope. <laughs> right. So, the, so there is hope. Um, so the, uh, I have a question here. What advice would you have for someone who has put up significant walls to prevent rejection and how to grow past that? So I could say, for example, that you just opted out of every family dinner from then on, and that way you wouldn't be late, as an example. Like that, those are the wall, kind of walls that you could put up. How do you, they weren't yours exactly, but just using that as, a, as an example, how then would you kind of deal with that? Yeah, I mean, people stop accepting invitations to parties, you know, because of this, um, or, you know, I'm just not even gonna, I'll just say no, I just won't go, um, yeah. because of the risk feels too, too dangerous in all these different ways emotionally. Um, so, again, back to what we talked about before, really first noticing the impact it's having on you, um, and then paying attention to uh, really the story is the biggest thing for me. And I, we use the word story in coaching a lot. So I don't know, hopefully you guys are getting the, the idea of what that means. It's, it's not, it's, it's what we're telling ourselves uh, is true or what is directing certain, certain things or a belief about something. And um, that, you know, I'm just late. I'm late all the time. I, I'm insensitive. That's a story that I've telling myself that I used to tell myself that's no longer true. Um, and, um, or that I'm difficult or I'm needy or emotional or too much. I'm too much. That's what people with emotional dysregulation talk about all the time. People just say I'm too much. Um, so I think what, what really, um, it really is important to, to challenge the stuff you're saying to yourself. You know, I say, you know, <laughs> call BS on it. That's how I say it, you know, with my clients and, and uh, is really, um, we have to challenge the stuff that we're saying to ourselves. First, pay attention to what's happening. And then what's the evidence that's true? So what happened for me, I took, uh, I took some pretty risky steps at the beginning when I figured out this was happening for me. And I was figuring out that it was impacting my, my close relationships. It was impacting um, my engagement with my family, with my friends, um, people who were, I have many people with ADHD do have problems making friends and keeping longtime friends. That has not been a problem for me. It's been one of, one of the areas of my life that has been very successful is nurturing long-term friendships and the community around me. They didn't get me. <laughs> Most of my longtime friends and family had no idea what was, who, you know, like they didn't get who I was. They loved me anyway, but I worried that I, that they wouldn't. That right. if they knew who I really was, or they knew all the things I really struggled with, I was no longer lovable. I was no longer worth spending time with. I mean, those are really deep things. So to be honest, I actually have worked, worked with a therapist on this too. So I'm not going to pretend that it's something for some of us, it's deeper. We need to also support, get support for these other reasons that, um, that drive the self-talk, the beliefs that become problematic. But being able to pay attention to those and looking at what is it that I'm saying to myself, what's the evidence it's true. I actually had, I wrote a letter to my best friend telling her how I was feeling. I said, this is what I'm telling myself about our relationship and how you see me. Um, it took me weeks to write it and actually send it. Um, but it, I, I, I finally laid it all out saying, this is what I'm telling myself about how you see me and, and how, uh, how I'm impacting your life and our friendship and, and, you know, me being this way, you know, this is how you see me and it's, it's problematic. And she did describe problems with my ADHD, how it had caused problems for, for our relationship in the past, but I had magnified it to like, she's no longer going to be my friend or, you know, love me anymore. If I, she knew all of these things about me. Um, so, she wrote, I wrote her that letter and she wrote me a letter back and it has transformed my life and our relationship and all other relationships I've had since then, because it actually, um, I was wrong about 90% of my beliefs. She called BS. <laughs> how she saw me and what was happening and what she was telling herself. I was wrong about most of it. And I, it was so deeply true in my mind because I had never questioned it. I'd never had the, I never aired it, right? So shame grows in the dark in, in silence. We don't talk about it or share it with people. It just grows and gets bigger and we hide in it. Um, and so, um, so once I aired it out, at first I was able to kind of breathe a little bit and that it didn't, it didn't die. I mean, I can't tell you how agonizing it was to wait for the letter back though. This was, you know, many years ago before we were regularly emailing and uh, texting and things like that. Um, but 
when I got it back, I just sobbed again because I was like, oh my God, thank God. She's not going to run away um, and uh, she still loves me. And oh my gosh, I was wrong about so many things. And so from that point on, and Brene Brown's work around, which I just alluded to sort of with the shame reference, her work talks about, you know, um, phrasing challenges and facing people by saying the story I'm telling myself is so that you're actually owning that it may not be true, but it's what you're saying to yourself. So you're not blaming anybody else for how you see your making me feel this way. That's like, don't, you know, stay away from that um, as much as you can, because nobody can make us feel that way. You know, it, owning our own feelings and our own impact is super important. So that was the biggest step for me was actually getting evidence to disprove the nonsense I was telling myself and I deeply believed because until I questioned those and came up with new stories, messages, my body, my physiology, I would react again as if it was true. My body would, would betray me. It would react before I could even be aware that I'd had a thought or a belief or a thing, a, you know, something. Um, and so then I could use those to counteract and kind of reassure myself. You know, what's the evidence? First I say, you know, okay, is that, is this true? What am I saying to myself? Is it true? And then, um, and then if, if, if I don't know, how do I find out? And that's the scariest part for many of us, but I actually started asking people and talking to the people around me that I loved and trusted and said, hey, when this happens, this is what I'm saying to myself. Can you help me understand what's happening or what's the reality on your end? How are things for you? And I'm constantly doing that now. I constantly check in. If I find myself in this emotional um, sensitivity, rejection sensitivity space of thinking I might be too much or may I've hurt somebody's feelings because they haven't responded to my text message, like, or if I write a really scary statement and I don't hear back right away, I could tell you that I could write a whole novel on all the reasons why the world is ending because I haven't heard back from this person quickly enough. And so then I, I go through what I, I call um, a perspective look. So what else could it be? What else could be happening? What else could be the reason why I haven't heard from them? And I just, I exhaust all the possibilities. And almost always that calms me down because I realize how ridiculous that may, that my first thought was <laughs> because there could be all these other things. Um, and so I think that's what I do is I really focus on, you know, being able to, to uh, think through these other ways and, and, and figuring out what other things it could be uh, to, to kind of retrain or re, you know, rewrite the stories I'm telling myself. And then the physiology re is calmed. You, you break that connection between the thought and the automatic response that your body has. Um, I found that transformational. It's still, you know, challenge this week. I had this, another experience with rejection sensitivity. <laughs> um, oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And so, but it doesn't, it doesn't totally um, derail me anymore. It doesn't totally put me offline. It doesn't completely knock me off um, and out of commission like it used to before where I was just in despair for periods of time. And I have some more healthy relationships than I ever have because there's open communication and that relationship with my friend has been better ever since it opened a door to open communication and, and she checks in with me. She knows it's a thing for me now to worry when I haven't connected with people. When I start my rejection sensitivity meter starts to ramp up. That's a red flag for me. Actually, when I want to retreat from people and I want to stop connecting, if I want to stop accepting invitations to things, if I want to stop reaching out and talking to people, that is a siren beacon red flag for me that I actually have to do the opposite. I have to connect with people because I'm feeling insecure, insecure in my connections. And so I have to reconnect with the people that I love and care about. Um, and then it just sort of resets that, that barometer for me and calms me down again. So figuring out what it is for you, for each of you is, is going to be, it's a really powerful, it's a life-changing thing to figure out what it is you need and getting it. Because you were talking about, so it can still creep up on you. And, mm -hmm. and they, this is, uh, well, I'll ask you the question. You'll see the link right away. Do you have any input as to how a mindfulness practice could have a positive or negative impact on our life as ADHD or since paying attention is so important to notice our emotional dysregulation? And that is absolutely true. The thing that I've struggled with and the thing that you, you say you still struggle with is... Um, noticing that it's happening. Well, I do pretty okay with it now noticing it, but, but yes, mindfulness is, is uh, what happened. What, what mindfulness does is it slows you down and gives you the pause um, to, to more quickly, more easily be able to either first not get as dysregulated in the first place. It really can keep, 
that the highs and lows more balanced um, for many of us because it, and if you do the self-talk work and the, you know, and the, you know, one of the other strategies. Breathing and the, yeah. Yeah. If, if people, in, you know, if, if it's a big enough thing to specifically, you know, coaches works with this kind of self-talk as well. That's also one of my areas of specialty, but there are therapists who focus on ADHD and CBT that, cognitive behavioral therapy that focus on thought patterns and reframing thought patterns and beliefs. And so that's something else we didn't specifically talk about at that type of specific therapy, but it's really powerful for, for talk, self-talk and negative thinking. You don't need that uh, always. Some people don't always need that, that level of, of structure, but it can be really transformational for some people or working with a coach uh, like myself who focuses on, uh, on self-talk and, and mindfulness and, um, self-perceptions uh, and right. emotional dysregulation. But I think, um, I think that that is uh, mindfulness practice. Actually, uh, it takes less effort. So it becomes habit. It's a habitual, it becomes more natural and it will, you'll notice yourself using it and having it kind of in your daily life uh, when it becomes a regular practice. It, it calms everything down. It can also just be also um, a, a really effective tool that's right at hand um, that isn't, um, that you, you with no one else can calm yourself down and, and, you know, not need these other things right away. They may be important to keep things more on balance when you can't, if you can't do that on your own, but many people find it very helpful and successful um, to use mindfulness regularly because it just, they're more present anyway so they are more aware and can catch like you said catch the thoughts before when more quickly or the triggers or just be more aware in general of of your surroundings and how you feel me people who do mindfulness are way more connected to their physiology how their body feels many of us with adhd are really disconnected from our bodies we are a lot in our head um, and don't pay attention to the what's happening in our bodies so reconnecting those two is it can be really transformational for people as well and mindfulness is one of the ways to do that Renee, thank you. Uh, everybody, that was Renee Crook. I don't know if anybody else was listening, but I learned a lot. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you so much. And, and for anybody who's looking for Renee, she runs the beginners group, uh, the support group over at ADA. Uh, so that'd be great to join ADA, join that group, pick her brain. Uh, she's there for you all the time. And Steve, I know you wanna say a few words. Yeah, I just wanted to say from those of us at, at Ratify, from Rick and myself, thank you both so much, Renee and Dwayne. Uh, we really appreciate it. I think this has been a phenomenally important and helpful uh, hour plus that we've spent together. Uh, so um, add.org is the ADA website. Uh, rena-fi.com is the Ratify website. You can find all sorts of information there for us. Uh, or about us, I should say. And then uh, just to wrap things up here real quick, I just want to toss it to our founder and CEO, Rick Webster, who is here with us so that he can uh, add his thanks as well and let uh, everybody know a little bit about uh, Renify before we go. Thanks. Rick? Yeah, you know, I've been volunteering with Chad and now with Ada for a period of 20 years. This has been a phenomenal education, really. You know, I hear a lot of the kind of pontification stuff. This is really amazing stuff about rejection sensitivities and, and that sort of thing. So I'm really thrilled that I, that I got here. I had another obligation, which is why I was late, but I'm really glad that I was able to tune in. Um, and yeah, I don't want to make it an infomercial, you know, check out Renify. We would love to have you. We do financial literacy from a behavioral standpoint. Um, just, just check this out. And I believe uh, most of you probably already know about ADA, but if you don't belong to ADA, it's whatever it is, it's 50 bucks a year. It's a rounding error on people's income. So I highly suggest that you join them as well. As a matter of fact, to encourage you to join ADA, add.org slash gift, G-I-F-T, and you can join and you'll get your first two months free. What's your URL, Renee? Um, added perspective coaching.com. So A D D E D uh, perspective coaching.com is how you can find me as a coach, or um, you can email me. The email that's uh, connected to Ada is the best one to reach me, renee.crook at outlook.com. Um, but yeah, this is, a, is such an important thing for me and with for my clients. In fact, I so big of a deal. I'm starting a coaching group focused specifically on this coming up. So it's a big thing um, that I know so many people struggle with. And I so appreciate being able to share my experiences and um, 
and uh, what I've learned <laughs> um, with so many of you because it is it's so it's such a it's diabolically confounding and, and really impacts us, but it is manageable and can really transform your life if you can get it under control. So we don't spend a lot of time talking about budgeting, adding and subtracting, you know, things that we could have done in sixth grade. We talk about the behavioral aspects, the emotional aspects of managing money. Why do you have a range for overpayment in your checkbook when you don't own a house yet? What emotionally drove you to make that decision? Um, so we really delve into the foundational reasons people have money problems as opposed to the, the surface reasons. We all know how to add and subtract. That's not the problem. It's, there's emotional issues that we need to address. With that, thank you, everybody. Again, Renee, Dwayne, Rick, thank you for joining us. And Renee, especially, thank you for all the great information that you gave us. Uh, and we will see you all. Uh, at our next event. Thanks. Bye-bye.